right. Hi, everyone. Wow. So nice to be back here. My first slush was actually in 2014, uh, and it's, it's awesome to see the energy is just as strong as it was back then. Uh, so my name is Paul Murphy. I'm a, a partner at Lightspeed. I uh, am based in London, and I lead our European efforts to expand uh, the franchise into Europe. Um, we have an amazing session here today with uh, John W. Thompson, who is a venture partner at Lightspeed. Uh, I want to dive into that, but before uh, I do so, I just want to tell you a little bit about Lightspeed in case you're not familiar with us. Uh, we are a global fund. We have 12 offices around the world in six countries. We have about $18 billion of assets under management. And this summer, we launched our latest fund family, which is just over $7 billion uh, to invest in everything from seed all the way up to pre-IPO rounds. Um, we've invested in some iconic U.S. companies that you might be familiar with, like uh, Snap and Affirm, but we actually have a whole host of companies in Europe as well, uh, about 30 at last count. Companies like Personio, Vinted, uh, Lightyear, many others. In fact, nearly half of our companies are outside of the U.S. So uh, with that, I want to jump in, talk a little bit about uh, John's amazing career. I'm lucky enough to call him a colleague. Uh, at Lightspeed, which is an incredible uh, thing for me to be able to do. He has 40 years of technology industry experience. <laughs> and before we jump into specific questions, I just want to ask John if you could tell us a bit about yourself. How did you end up here? What did you want to be when you grew up? Yeah. Those sorts of things. Well, I grew up in West Palm Beach, Florida. And it is about the biggest contrast to where we are today <laughs> than anywhere else in the world, because the temperature there never gets below 72 degrees. But nonetheless, I grew up in a family where my father was a military guy, became a postal worker, and my mother was a local school teacher who ultimately, as her career progressed, she became a principal and administration, administrator, if you will, in the county school system. The one thing, though, that I will never forget about my life experience with my mother and father my mother had a point of view about life, which is life is about lifelong learning. And so you should plan to learn your entire life. And I translated that into, I will never retire. Because if you're going to learn your entire life, you can't stop working. And so while you said I've been in the industry for more than 50 years, the actual number is almost 40 years. The actual number is almost 53, and I'll cross that 53 mark in June of this year. Never in my wildest dreams, never ever, did I imagine being in tech. As a matter of fact, I wanted to be a lawyer because the most prominent people in the African American community in the 1960s were teachers, preachers, doctors, and lawyers. And I knew I couldn't be either of the first three. And so I opted to go to law school. Well, lo and behold, six months before going to law school, I sat down with my father-in-law, who was a very prominent attorney in West Palm Beach, and said, here's what I'm thinking. I'd like to go back to law school. And he looks at me and says, okay, let's talk about that. How much money do you make now? And I told him it was about a little over $10,000 a year. And so he says, so where do you think you'll be a year from now? I said, well, I'm about to go on quota. So I'll have my first full IBM territory to sell into. And generally, your salary goes up by 75 to 100% in that first year. He says, really? I went, yep, really. He says, well, where do you think you'll be three years from now? And I said, well, I suspect I'll be 3x more than I make now. And really? And he says, why would you ever leave that job to go to law school where you will make essentially the same amount of money in your first year that you make now? And it was that conversation with my father-in-law, who's long since passed away, that got me to say, I'm going to stay. And I'm going to try to concentrate on technology in a way that I can be effective. And quite frankly, I can develop some experiences that are valuable to others in the industry. So 53 years in this industry has been an incredible journey for me. And I expect to go another 50 years. <laughs> we, we have the same expectations. So um, I think you know, there's a few chapters of your career that I want to dive into and we can all learn from. Sure. Let's start with IBM. So yeah. you spent 28 years there. Uh, you've seen, you saw presumably a lot of change. What were the kind of highlights, key learnings from your time there? Well, IBM is an amazing company, or at least it was during the period of time that I was working there. And one of the things I came to recognize is that 
it's a structured environment and you had to learn how to deal in that structure. And back in those days, it was always about blue suits and white shirts. Well, I was from a community that didn't wear blue suits and white shirts. I wore what I call two sister suits, Polly and Esther, and they were any color but blue. (laughs) And sure enough, as time progressed, I came to realize, while you may be smart enough to advance your career, you're not aligned enough to advance your career at IBM. And I ended up moving to, from Tampa, Florida, my first job at IBM, to Atlanta. And while there, I said, I need to buy a wool suit that's navy blue, and I need to buy a white shirt and a striped tie. And that was the aha moment for me, that it was more about cultural acceptance, not trying to fight who you were and what you wanted to be. And candidly, the stay in Atlanta was a great inflection point. And about five years later, I get a call that says, we'd like for you to come to Boston to be the director, or I'm sorry, the regional sales manager here. And I thought, what a great place to go. Well, back then, Boston did not have the reputation as being an embracing community. And I was going through a divorce, and I didn't want to go because of the nature of the community and my two young kids. But I finally made a decision that I'll go, because I can always go back to Atlanta, which is the African-American mecca of the United States. And so I went to Boston, and the leader of that region decided, I like you. And oh, by the way, I want to prove that Boston nor me are ethnically biased. And so within six months, I was his chief of staff. Within a year, I was running a branch. Within two years, my branch was the top branch in the nation. And then six months later, I get a call from the chairman of the board saying, Tag, we want you to go to MIT Sloan School, we'll pay your tuition, and we'll continue to pay your salary. And so my IBM journey was one that I never imagined, but that decision to move to Boston was the most important inflection point in my career. Never again did anything that spectacular happen. I mean, it's pretty amazing. So what brought you from Boston to then Silicon Valley? to go run some Well, I had been at IBM for 27 years, nine months, and 13 days. And I knew I was never going to get to run the company. And I had joined my first corporate board when I was running our Midwest operation. And I would sit in the boardroom, and people had these fancy epilepsies that said CEO, chairman, president. And I said, head of sales for the Midwest. And it was so narrow. And I went, wait a minute. They don't know that much more than I do. And if they can have those fancy titles, why can't I? And sure enough, I called John T. Thompson at Hydric and Struggles and said, don't come to see me anymore about a sales job or a marketing job or a product management job. If it's not a CEO role, I'm not interested. Well, sure enough, 90 days or so later, I get an email note that says in the subject line, perfect match. And I click on the note and it has no content. So I immediately called John and said, what is this about? And he says, well, I have a little company that I've been working with for years called Symantec. I went, yeah, I think I know them. He says, they're looking for a new CEO. Are you interested? I said, well, I don't know. It's a consumer product company. I'm an enterprise guy. He says, they need somebody who's a tech leader. Do you want to join the company? I said, well, I'd like to meet some people first. So I flew to California. I met with the team. And I concluded, why not? I'm about to turn 50, and if I ever want to run a company, I better do it now. Otherwise, I just won't get there. And I joined Symantec then, and we took it from 600 million in revenue to 6 billion over a 10-year period. And I had a wonderful journey, and I concluded, I'll never retire. I'll never retire. Because if you can do that, you can do it again, because you've learned something from that experience. And while I may not have an interest in being an operator anymore, I do want to be an advisor and consultant and advocate, if you will, for the teams. And that was in part why yeah. I joined Lightspeed. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I think just you know, getting the sense of scale, $600 million to $6 billion in revenue um, is, is a massive feat, but actually not the biggest one in your career. So we'll come to some of that in a bit. But I just want to understand some of the nuances of how you took a company from 600 to $6 billion in revenue. That's... I just can't even think about how you would achieve that. Well, as I said, it was a consumer packaged software company when I got there. So they had 
a very strong gaming business, a very strong connectivity business, a little security company called Norton Antivirus, and a few other things. And it generated $600 million in revenue. But I was from a company that had a diverse portfolio, but it had concentrations within categories. And I couldn't understand how this company, with all of these diverse categories, as small as it was, could really leverage to scale. And I learned something from my IBM experience, which was I would spend the first 100 days listening. That's why you have two ears and one mouth. You should listen. And so I listened and concluded we need to get out of all of these related businesses that are not security related. Because in 1999, the security problem was escalating exponentially. So we did that. And we bought a little company in North Carolina or somewhere and started the journey to become a true security company and sold off many of the assets that weren't security or enterprise related. And the end result was we kind of progressed quite well for the first 18 months to two years. And then two years in, I pre-announced an earnings miss. And the stock price dropped 35% in one day. And I was like devastated. And I came to the conclusion, wait a minute, we're doing what's right. So you should not be devastated by this. Just stay focused. Well, lo and behold, two weeks, three weeks later, the first self-propagating self virus called Nimda hit the marketplace. And we were in market with a new product, and McAfee, our top competitor, was not. And the company took off. And the rest is history. I mean, wow. it's a very different company today yeah. than when I left it. But nonetheless, 600 million to 6 billion, you don't do that without yeah. effort, without yeah. building a great team. And quite frankly, being comfortable with the team you've built. Great. OK, so I want to shift uh, topics a little bit and talk about um, boards. So you know, the founders in the room, you, you presumably have formed a board if you've raised capital. Um, this is a topic that uh, I talk to the founders I work with in Europe quite a lot because I think that um, there's a lot we can still learn as to how to have effective boards. Um, you know, John, you sat on the board or sit on the board of Microsoft, um, which is you know, one of the largest companies in the world. Uh, you joined in 2012, I believe. Before we talk about your Microsoft journey specifically, maybe you could just give all of us sort of your view as to what a board and an independent director should do for a company. Yeah. Well, I, I've been very clear from the very beginning that just because you have a seat at the board table doesn't mean you run the company. The CEO runs the company. And I think it's damn important for the board to all come to that and recognize that they are there to provide insight and counsel, not to run the company. And I was quite clear about that at Microsoft. Um, and in my early days there, it was clear that in my opinion, it was time for a change. That Steve had been there for 12 years, had done a good job of making sure that the revenue continued to move, but had not done as good a job in improving the stock performance. And they then asked me to not just be a board member, but be the lead independent director. And before too long, I lead the search, and I want an outsider. And sure enough, I couldn't find one because nobody wanted any part of Microsoft at that point in time. And so we turned to two relevant insiders. And I remember one of the important statements that Bill made to me early in the search process, which is, the company is in technology trouble now. And we need a leader at the top who is, in fact, a technologist. And that was a very, very important statement that yeah. resonated with me as I was looking at the two final candidates. And we selected Satya who had a very, very strong technology background, having worked at Sun for a few years and then joining Microsoft. Um, that journey, to my surprise, led to an appreciation in the stock price that I never would have expected. Yeah, I mean, when I, so I actually spent eight years at Microsoft. I unfortunately left the year before John joined and sold all my stock uh, when I left because I thought it's been flat for eight, nine years, it's never going to change. Um, and of course, John and the sort of new leadership come in. And I, I, I was trying to do rough math, but it was about one and a half trillion dollars of value creation happened in the last decade. One and a half trillion dollars. I mean, that's just, you know, incomprehensible. So what, what do you think? I mean, earnings were growing the whole time I was there. Revenue yeah. was growing, employees were growing, but what changed under Satya's leadership? Well, I, I think what 
people perceived was that Steve did not have as strong a technology insight as Bill did, or candidly paging forward as Sacha did. And one of the things that Sacha made very clear from the very beginning as his, in his role as CEO is that we're going to have a top position in the cloud. We're not going to be number three, four, or five. We want to be number one or number two. And he and Scott Guthrie, who runs the cloud business for Microsoft, have doubled down and they have created a very, very important business for Microsoft. More importantly, however, is if you look underneath, many of the technology things that they have done quietly are incredible. And I can't wait for them to announce a few of those products in the yeah. marketplace. Well, it's exciting. We're, uh, we'll be anticipating that. Um, so, okay, so if we move on from your, your role you know, at, on the Microsoft board, you also sit on, I think it's five other, uh, or three, you sit on four, five four, boards in total? Four others. Um, one, few, one public and three private. Okay, and a few of those are light speed companies, uh, which, is, which is amazing. As a, as a board member, and you talked a bit about the board doesn't run the company, the CEO and the management team run the company, but what do you view the, the key job of the CEO to be now with all the experience that you've kind of accumulated and witnessed over the years? Well, it's important for the CEO to have a strong and deep perspective on the marketplace that he or she is trying to penetrate. And it's equally strong for them to use their ears and mouth proportionately. And all too often, leaders feel that they have to tell the world what they're thinking before they think through what they should be thinking. And I learned from my early days on the Microsoft board how important it was to listen, not to talk. Yeah. Because many of the people in the room, who will go nameless, wanted to talk yeah. rather than listen. And I think that's an important issue for every leader at any level of an organization. Listen, comprehend, and then act. And that's what I did for 10 years at Symantec. I think we're, we're seeing right now um, you know, the, the role of a company culture, a corporate culture, playing, you know, increasingly being part of why some companies grow and survive challenges and others maybe sort of die off. Um, when I think about going into an environment like Microsoft or other companies you've been involved in, sometimes the CEO needs to reset the culture and get, you know, hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of people behind them. Um, what, what do you think the most effective way to do that? We're witnessing some of this play out in the public space right now with, with new CEOs making dramatic changes. I mean, jury's out as to how that's going to work. Do you have any views as to how you shift culture? Well, I, I think people will follow a leader who they respect and admire. And I think as Sacha came in to an organization that candidly was very much technology-centered or long-term technology-centered, many on the team truly respected his background and experience and had confidence that he could lead the company to a place where the top-line performance of the company would, in fact, expand. And I, as I alluded to earlier, he's one of the people that, while he may be one of the smartest people in the room, he's not the loudest person in the room. He's not the one who has the most to say in the room. He uses his ears and mouth proportionately, and that's developed an enormous amount of respect from not just the Microsoft team, but from our partners and our customers around the world. Amazing. Okay, so you know, I want to talk a little bit about now your role as an investor, uh, because sort of you mentioned one email that you got, and you know, my, I know in my conversations with you, you've actually had many emails and phone calls like that uh, from uh, kind of all walks of life, uh, the most senior levels uh, in p politics and technology. Um, I'm very happy with Lightspeed, but why did you join Lightspeed? Why are you why are you an investor now? Yeah. Well, I, um, as I was winding down my chapter three, which was running a little startup that I was going to run for 90 days, I ended up running it for six years. As I was winding that down, it was like, okay, I'm never going to retire, so what's the next journey on this chapter, or next chapter in this journey? And I joined a firm that the, one of the founding partners was a very, very good friend and co-investor with me, and that was Riverwood Capital. And Riverwood does terrific job at supporting later stage companies. And I didn't realize how late stage it was compared to some of what I wanted to do. But more importantly, they had a business process that was not as engaging as I expected it to be. And so I would show up in the office at 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning and leave at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon 
and I'd do nothing, not a damn thing all day long because they had a more controlled approach to how they manage the assessment and ultimate decision to invest in a deal. And because I was a new guy on the team, they were like, we don't want you. <laughs> and so I'm like, I got to get out of here. And to my surprise, um, Arif Jamohammed from Lightspeed kept sending me notes saying, you should join our team, you should join our team. And I was candidly pretty adamant that I would not join the Lightspeed team because my startup that I had been running for six years went under, in large part because the major partner at Lightspeed went thumbs down when I asked for more capital. And I'm like, holy smokes, why would I ever go to work for that firm? Well, I went there and went to the Monday meeting, the partner meeting, and I was incredibly impressed. And then following that were two early stage companies that had come in for reviews with the team, and I was overwhelmed by then. And I turned to Arif and I said, can I start tomorrow? <laughs> because that was what I wanted to do when I was leaving Symantec. I had invested in about six or eight little companies over my last two years at Symantec because my intent was to become an early stage investor after I finished my role at Symantec. Well, I got distracted for six years <laughs> running virtual instruments. And now I'm able to do, because of my journey with Lightspeed, what I had intended to do some eight or nine years ago. I've invested directly in probably 20 or more companies since I joined Lightspeed. I obviously invest in all of their funds and what have you, but I'm far more interested in the engagement with the founders and their teams to see if I can help in some way yeah. to make them, help them scale. So what, what are some of those, you know, the founders that you've gravitated towards? Are there any qualities or characteristics that well, you really get excited about? One of the ones that is destined to go public soon is Rubrik. And the founder of Rubrik, co-founder of Rubrik, I should say, was a partner at Lightspeed, and he came to see me when he had this idea about marrying backup and recovery and security. And lo and behold, when I spent, I don't know, $11 billion for Veritas, that's what we were trying to do. But the market was not mature enough at that point to see those things come together. So it became an absolute disaster. Well, Rubrik is now the fastest growing company in the history of Silicon Valley, or at least that's what some say. And they have the potential to do an IPO when the market is stable. Uh, we've done all of the prep for the filing and what have you. But I get to spend time with Bipple daily. Mm. As a matter of fact, at 3 a.m. this morning, he called. <laughs> and I had to make sure I turned my damn phone off so I wouldn't get any more calls. But it's that part of the journey that's so exciting to me that you can find brilliant young founders who don't start with the obnoxiousness of, I'm brilliant and you should acknowledge that. Yeah. They start more, but I don't know what you know. Let's share insights together. And that experience with Bipple and the Rubrik team has been amazing. It's been good at Illumina, and it's been equally good at all of the companies that I've been involved in. Yeah, I think that the curiosity, certainly for me as well, it's, it's high talent, high curiosity, and decent amount of humility. Nice combo. Um, okay, so I'm going to, again, shift gears one more time in the time that we have left. It, uh, you know, since the time that you agreed to come out to, to Helsinki, which thank you very much for doing that. My pleasure. This uh, has been an amazing event. I've never been here before. Yeah. and. If I get invited back, I will definitely. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's awesome to have, have you here. Um, but, you know, in that time, the world has, has continued to change. And it's been very challenging for a lot of people. I'm sure many of you in the room, uh, you know, you might have had, you know, your personal companies get devalued, might have struggled to raise financing or had even personal wealth wiped out with what's happened. Um, it's trying times. Uh, for sure. And, and, you know, you've been through more than a few cycles um, any advice, words of wisdom, things that have gotten you through those tough times that you could share with the, the founders in the room? Well, I, I think in a challenging economic environment like the one that we're going through now, every company, big or small, has to start with, do I have the right team? And then do I have enough capital to make it through, particularly for startups, to make it through at least two years? Because you never know how long the recovery period is going to take. And I, that's one of the issues I learned shortly after I joined Lightspeed was how much capital do these teams really need to have on their balance sheet, particularly as you enter challenging times. More importantly, however, I think the founding team has to come together in a way that 
unifies them, particularly when they're operating in a challenging market. And it's incredible to me to look at some of the early stage companies that I'm involved in and how they're going through a change cycle now because the company has matured, but it's time, quite frankly, to make some changes in the leadership team yeah. because of the scale that they've reached and what they need to do the next cycle around. And that's where I get to be very, very involved, quite frankly. Okay. That's great. Um, so we are out of time. I do have one last question, which okay. is, um, are you writing a book? And Hell it, no. <laughs> <laughs> Some of I've us. been asked to write a book, oh my gosh, for years. Yeah. And I just don't believe in that. I, my view is the world will come to interpret who I am and what I've done based upon what they learn. I don't need to tell the world yeah. who I am and what I've done. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed learning about your career in preparing for this session. And, and thank you for sharing this, uh, your, your lessons with the team. My pleasure. So thank, thank you, very you all much, very guys. much. Yeah. So, okay, so.